Hey everybody, um, look, somebody put some sunblock in my tanning lotion, so please pardon my appearance as I dig into the story, imagery, and filmmaking of the Better Call Saul season five finale. Whoo boy, I am ready to have another basement breakdown right now. Okay. Season five finale, something unforgivable. Here's what we're gonna do. This breakdown is gonna concentrate on the Kim and Jimmy storyline. I got a whole other breakdown for the Lalo storyline in this episode, and that link is in the description. But right now, let's talk about the opening shot of this episode. No time has passed since the end of the previous episode. Kim looks through the peephole, and what does she see? Well, she sees that the bad man is gone. The bad man is gone thanks to her, thanks to her quick thinking. The scale of the close-up and the content of the shot, to me, echo the shots we saw of Mike looking through his sniper rifle scope in the last episode. Mike was ready to dispatch Lalo with his rifle, and it turns out that Kim dispatched him using only her words. At the same time, I'm also tempted to read this beam of light the other way, because this intense spot of light here almost seems to bore a hole in Kim in this shot, almost like someone's holding up a magnifying glass, right, and burning a hole in her. It suggests a sight trained on her. This duality is woven throughout the episode. Kim is increasingly driven by her sense that she is a dangerous person. And Jimmy's decision making in this episode is driven more and more by his sense that he's placed Kim in danger. Hence the urgency of his retreat to the swanky hotel. Jimmy not only feels that he's put Kim in peril, but he continues to be occupied with this idea that he has somehow ruined Kim. Shortly after they check into the hotel, Kim goes to shower to clean up after her dirty dealings in the criminal world, and Jimmy expresses his concern quite plainly. He says, Am I bad for you? Kim's reaction is so striking. She tells the perennial slippin' Jimmy lie. You crossed a line. You're not gonna do it again. Look, Kim knows this is nonsense. Again, I return to that pivotal argument in Wexler v. Goodman when Kim calls out this specific lie. It, it, it will never happen again. That's a lie. So we know she knows this is a lie. So we know what Kim is really saying is, Hey buddy, this is the story, right? Remember the story you always tell so you can keep doing bad stuff? It'll never happen again. We'll get on board. That's the story we're gonna tell here. And again, I'll note that this has always been Jimmy's lie. And now Kim is the one telling it, forcing it on him, really, because she's assuming more of that Saul Goodman role. Early in the season, we glimpsed a state of affairs where Jimmy and Saul were taking up so much space, it seemed there wasn't much room left for Kim. Remember this shot I talked about of Saul Goodman's suits uh -huh. leaving precious sure. little space in the frame for Kim. Right. Now, before she turns off the light, what does Kim say to Jimmy? Come on, make room. Where she was forced to make room for Saul, now Jimmy has to make room for slippin' Kimmy, Kim Goodman, whatever you want to call it, this dangerous force that is newly emboldened in Kim. And frankly, why wouldn't Kim feel bold? She just stared down an international drug lord armed with nothing but a story. And she did so in a moment when Jimmy had clearly lost. He had clearly failed. So it's not unreasonable for Kim to think, hey, maybe I'm a better Saul Goodman than Jimmy is. And as the episode goes on, Kim does less and less to hide this sentiment. When Jimmy says that he already tried to force the Sandpiper Crossing case into a settlement, Kim says, Yeah, but you went about it wrong. <laughs> Sorry, but this is how you do it. Kim feels she has perfected the Saul Goodman formula. In her mind, she's distilled it so that the formula can be executed without the recklessness and emotionality of Jimmy and without compunction. This is important because Kim believes that she can offset her bad acts with good ones, and thereby she hopes to ward off the black mold of moral rot that has consumed Jimmy's soul, as we've seen in this season and past seasons. Balancing that personal ledger of good and evil is Kim's mission as she speaks with Grant from the Public Defender's Office. I love Grant. The background of the Breaking Bad uh, Better Call Saul universe is just filled with public servants like Grant. They're decent, they're dedicated, but they're jaded from years spent in a flawed system. They carry themselves with what I'd call a healthy cynicism, and as such, they tend to look askance at Kim's moments of bold idealism. 
as Grant does here. When Kim asks for the really tough public defender cases, he points to his heart and speaks the truth in the room. You want the clients that'll get you, you know, in here. Grant's suggestion is that Kim is looking to cleanse her soul, and it's fair to say that that's accurate. But the moment has a darker note, too, because Grant is pointing to this same spot that has been used to punctuate Jimmy's trauma in the later episodes of the season here. In revisiting this spot with this jabbing motion, I sense a faint hint that Kim is not working in Jimmy's best interests. It foreshadows the crisis of trust that ends this episode and ends the season. To me, it also foreshadows conflict that may be yet to come in season six. That's just my guess. Kim's approach, I think you would call it utilitarian if you were a philosophy student. Student. She's accumulating these good acts like currency, stocking up on the good deeds that will nourish her, so she has license in her internal moral calculation to spend that virtue money, those virtue bucks, on the bad things that really thrill her. So her tack is, give me those tough cases because those are worth the most virtue bucks. Grant keeps piercing this bubble of Kim's heroic self-image, though, like his remark about burnouts. I had more burnouts than usual this last quarter. When he first brings up this word burnouts, it seems to impart a certain heroism, right? Because the idea is that this public defender work is so harrowing um, that some people just can't handle it anymore. It makes Kim seem maybe valiant and courageous that she's taking it on. But then Grant explains what he means by that word. That's what I call taking that private firm gig, getting that sweet company car, burning rubber on your way out. After he explains it, the image is now one of everyone else fleeing to greener pastures. In that light, Kim sounds mm, courageous, maybe, but also kind of foolish, right? At the very least, out of sync with her professional community because the image is everybody's going this way and here's Kim going in the opposite direction. It's a dynamic that sets up her encounter with Howard. Howard? They meet first in the elevator. Yeah. Howard introduces Kim, tells her story to the associates here. Howard doesn't have the latest on Kim. It would be simpler for Kim to just let it go, but she is just not in a mood right now to have someone else tell her story for her. And unfortunately, that is all Howard wants to do in this sequence. This is Kim Wexler. She's an HHM alum and now heads up banking at Schweikert & Coakley. They get off at the third floor. The three glows in the frame. Take care, Howard. Um, there are a bunch of threes peppered throughout this episode. It's sort of a stylistic tick of uh, Better Call Saul. I've said it before, when you see a three featured this prominently in a dialogue between two people, and it certainly is prominent here because it's called out in the script. Uh, what floor? Three, please. When you see that... Three, so prominently, to me it's an invitation to consider the third party that's influencing the dialogue that's happening on screen. At least I'm going to take it as such. Most explicitly, the third party is Jimmy. He becomes a subject of their conversation, but most poignantly, I think the third party is Chuck, and I'll explain why I think so. Howard trails her out of the elevator and asks him what her story is, and every time she tells him what her story is, he's like, what? That can't be right. Kim, let me Howard explain to you what your story is. So he drags her into a courtroom where all the lights are turned off, the same way they used to be whenever Chuck was around. In fact, I'm reminded of a particular scene in the season two episode, Nailed, in which Chuck tells Kim about Jimmy's copy shop switcheroo. I'll recap a few highlights from that conversation to give context to the scene we're considering here. In this earlier scene, Chuck framed his anger at Jimmy in terms of concern for Kim. Hey, you know what? We don't have to listen to this. She does. You do. For your own good. He condescended to her as a damsel in distress. I can't stand the fact that you've deceived and ruined this fine young woman. Ruined? What is this, the 1840s? And the most crucial moment came when Chuck casually deprived Kim of any agency. And now that you know, you have no choice. That's the moment when Chuck unwittingly turns Kim against him, when his premise becomes that she has no choice. So let's keep that past chapter in mind as we return to this episode. First of all, Kim <laughs>, laughs at Howard's story, and when you think about it, of course she laughs. Like 24 hours ago, Jimmy was telling her that while he was trying to transport millions of dollars in drug money, cartel thugs ambushed him and he was only saved by this mysterious man with a sniper rifle. Right? Now here's Howard. Jimmy threw bowling balls at my car. Can you believe it? Like, Howard's in a different universe. He has no idea, but he's in a different universe. Of course Kim laughs. It seems so trifling. 
And even if you have sympathy for Howard here, which I think we can, he certainly has been tormented cruelly by Jimmy. The problem is, why's he got to make it about her? Why's it always got to be, hey, I'm mad at Jimmy, so Kim, you're crazy, which is basically what it amounts to in this conversation. Howard goes through the same motions as Chuck did. He drapes his anger at Jimmy in concern for Kim. Before you make any big changes in your life, there's something about Jimmy you ought to hear. And he casually deprives Kim of her agency. It makes no sense to drop a client like Mesa Verde. And I got to think Jimmy had something to do with that. He refuses to accept that Kim has any choice in the course of her career. And by the end of the scene, the parallel has become explicit. You know who really knew Jimmy? Chuck. I think it would be a mistake to believe that these men don't respect Kim. They definitely do. They respect her as a professional and as a lawyer. But their anger at Jimmy causes them to twist that respect around because they need their anger to be validated so badly. And furthermore, Kim, the virtuous up-and-comer, is the perfect person to validate their rage because they admire how much she's not like Jimmy. They admire her for being everything Jimmy isn't. They insist she validate their anger. And ultimately, their insistence comes at the cost of Kim having a say in the matter, of Kim having a say in the course of her own story. That was the something unforgivable for Kim with Chuck, and it's the something unforgivable here with Howard. I want to emphasize this point. It's a paradox, but it's true to life. It's Kim's very virtues, or more precisely, other people's projection of those virtues onto her that lead these men to think that they can exploit her in their interests. I mean, it's basically like, Kim, you're the greatest. Wow, you're perfect. And because you're perfect, you have to do what I want. Like, what a compliment, right? And Kim loves to hear it. Do you have any idea how insulting that is? Kim is so exhausted by the burden of being everybody else's angel. She's so tired of this halo being put on her and then transformed into a shackle. Season five, Kim says, enough. And in the finale, more forcefully than ever, she insists she's gonna turn this halo into an asset that works for her. Because if she doesn't, someone else is gonna use it instead. If Kim is everybody's angel, that applies twofold for Jimmy. Kim's acceptance of him as a linchpin in their codependency, and I explored this idea a little more deeply in my 50% off breakdown. What I'll say here is simply that Kim is Jimmy's moral backstop. She's such a good person in his mind and in others that by accepting him in his mind, it makes an implicit statement about him that he can't be all bad. And with this backstop, he feels his own license to go out to do bad things, to cut ethical corners, because as long as she backs him up, he's still holding on to this shred of decency. Of course, if Kim is going to continue to redeem Jimmy, she not only has to stay with Jimmy, but she has to remain Kim the Good. She has to remain this saint figure, right? Or else the whole bottom drops out from under Jimmy. And Jimmy instinctively senses this peril. It manifests by his timeless insistence that he alone is responsible for anything that the two of them do wrong. Am I bad for you? It's just another version of this. Another example comes from the season three finale. After Kim's car accident, Jimmy tries to say that it was his fault. Look, you were just doing what you thought you had to do because of me. And even in her wounded state, Kim pushes back and note the substance of her response. I'm an adult, I made a choice. She reasserts her adulthood. She reestablishes her agency. Kim resists that halo of perfection when she feels it trapping her and infantilizing her. But Jimmy always embraces Kim's halo because his salvation depends on it. For him, Slip and Kimmy represents a potential slip into total darkness. If the light of Kim the Good no longer shines on him, that's darkness. And this is one source of Jimmy's alarm as Kim conjures these devious visions of the future. Let's appreciate the rhythm of this room service scene, the dialogue, these punctuation marks of or, 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 or the constant push in of the cameras. The intimacy of the image escalates in waves and the liveliness of the performance grows too and the pranks escalate. But then a sudden cut to this apparent post-climax. The crescendo reverses. The atmosphere is muffled, soft pale. The Howard revenge fantasies grow lighter into almost nothing. Oh, we could switch his toilet paper. We or. could thwart a suntan. These tiny little pranks. And the audio 
dwindles to a whisper. And in this stillness, with their concerns about to drift away on wings of gossamer, Kim suggests, hey, what if we destroy Howard's life? She savors the contrast between the lightness of the moment and the weight of her idea. It's another instance where the filmmakers and Kim, I think, are in cahoots to subvert our expectations. What happens after this is a sort of double accounting. First, she totals up the potential Sandpiper Crossing take with Jimmy in terms of actual dollars. And then she sort of does an accounting of all the virtue bucks that she'll earn by fantasizing about her pro bono practice. Kim fantasizes that after she's burned all her professional bridges, that the young, up-and-coming legal minds in Albuquerque are going to flock to this pie-in-the-sky legal practice where she intends to... Give regular people the kind of representation usually only millionaires get. Robin Hood has entered the building. Destroy one Howard and save countless lives. The way she phrases it, they are turning a virtue profit. Remember Jimmy telling Kim that he had a system to manage all his clients? I got 45 clients. 45? How are you going to handle all that? I got a system, but... Well, this utilitarian moral approach to me is Kim's system. I draw the comparison because in this scene, I'm sure you felt it too, the Saul Goodman spirit is alive and well in Kim. Watch and appreciate the nuances of Ray Seahorn's performance as she reframes their scorched earth plan as a mere... A career setback for one lawyer. Her eyes, the conspiratorial little gestures with her head, she looks like Saul. She looks and acts more like Saul than Jimmy does right now. A little grace note that highlights this dynamic. When Kim is making ice cream sundaes, Jimmy says, I'll have a little of everything. Actually, leave off the mint chip. No mint chip. Now, as regular viewers of The Breakdown know, that green color, and in season five, this green ice cream in particular, is used to illustrate those moments when Jimmy is in this go, go, go mode. That's Saul Goodman mania. Green means go, and green is also the color of cash for those moments when Saul's humming along so well he's practically minting money. Watch my breakdown on the ice cream cone if you want to dig more into that. Right now, I'll just say Jimmy saying that he doesn't want the mint chip ice cream is a little nod to the audience to show us that Jimmy is decidedly not in that go, go, go mode. Maybe you don't need to decode a semi-obscure frozen treat image to get at that, but still, it's there, and I was not about to let an ice cream appearance go unremarked. In any case, Jimmy's not Saul right now, and it feels more and more like Kim is. Jimmy can feel a reversal. Come on, Kim. We're not talking about a bar trick here. His response is, you've got it all wrong. He just wants to put that halo back on her head, right? Kim, doing this, it's not you. Incredible reaction shot as Kim pulls back, like, oh, really? The character swirl of good and evil is captured in one image. You can practically see the halo that Jimmy's trying to project on her, this warm light that frames her. It's almost a Madonna image. But the center of the frame is cold. That hard gaze with which Kim beholds Jimmy, it's a Lolo-esque gaze to me, that pinprick of light on the darkness. Compare that to the energy of the reverse shot, Jimmy's eyes are bright and pleading, and he's framed by these gradients of blue light in the background, which is fitting as he says to Kim, You would not be okay with it. Not in the cold light of day. The role reversal deepens. Now Jimmy is the voice of the blue light, the cold light of day. He says, utilitarianism be damned, Kim, because in the final judgment, you always examine yourself in the blue light. And that's how I know you would not choose this path. Wouldn't I? Kim's response amounts to, essentially, I write my own story. And so Jimmy ends up making the same plea to Kim that he made to Mike early in the episode. He asked Mike, what's the end of the story? You are not blowing me off with any, that's not the end of the story. Crap, not just specifics. With Mike, Jimmy gets what he believes to be the end of the story, although we know otherwise. And Jimmy gets it by making a case that Mike is sympathetic to. He's saying that he's got to protect his people. He's got to protect Kim. And in order to do that, he's got to know what's up. So Mike provides Jimmy with an ending in the interest of Kim. The irony is that later Kim deprives Jimmy of that same satisfaction. She does not give him an ending in that final exchange of the season. Kim, you're shitting me, right? Kim has become more openly disdainful of Jimmy as these hotel room scenes have progressed. And now this is the capper. 
three days after a cartel hitman pointed a gun at Jimmy's head, she's given him the finger pistols? It's a strikingly callous gesture. And it's one that mirrors the Saul Goodman, here's looking at you gesture at the conclusion of season four, when Saul Goodman, attorney at law, made his triumphant debut. It's all good, man. There's parallels also in the rhythm of the cinematography and staging. At the end of season four, we saw Kim watching Jimmy turn his back on her and walking away. And the camera pulled back to emphasize that distance between them as she realizes that her companion has transformed into a darker figure than she might have thought. Now Jimmy experiences the same kind of moment. Again, the camera pulls back to emphasize the distance between the two. A season later, Kim has flipped the script on Jimmy. In drawing out the parallels, let's not overlook the nuances that are specific to this moment. Bob Odenkirk shapes this long take really nicely with sensitivity. Jimmy smiles for a second. It's almost as if the flint of Kim's criminality has ignited a spark in him, like the Saul Goodman machine is about to rev up again, but the engine doesn't quite turn over. Because like Kim before him, after that moment of excitement, Jimmy is left to consider the part he played in creating this person that he doesn't recognize. Meanwhile, in the background, we hear the shower running. And Kim's season closes by evoking one last time that cycle that Kim now seems poised to embrace to an extreme. Get dirty, get clean, to live without fear of the light of day. That's it on this storyline. If you want to hear more, jump over to the Lalo video. Link's in the description. I'll admit, I'm not quite done with Kim. You know, I have my suspicions about this box of records, and I have my suspicions about that marriage certificate from earlier in the season, too. Stay tuned for some deranged season six speculation here on the channel. Uh, in the meantime, thanks to the creative team that makes this awesome show. Thank you for sharing season five of Better Call Saul with me. If you're new to the channel, hey, since you watched this far, you probably had a pretty good time. So why not subscribe? As always, this was my take. Share your perspective in the comments. Um, the community around the videos this season has just been amazing. It's been inspiring. Thank you so much. Shout out to intrepid editor Brendan. If you ever want to say hello to me, you can email me breakdowns at ological.net. Hit that subscribe button. See you soon. Bye for now.